Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Savitt. I'm happy to welcome you back to the Center for Security Policy for our webinar series. Remember, we do this every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. To check our schedule, go to securefreedom.org and check under the webinar tab. I'll also give you a preview of upcoming events at the end of today's broadcast. Today, uh, our program is entitled Veterans in the Fight, Protecting Our Nation's Power Supply After the Collapse of the Texas Electric Grid. Featuring our guests, Ambassador Hank Cooper and Michael Maybe, and hosted by my center colleague, Tommy Waller. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box on your GoToWebinar panel. I'll read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, and on our website at securefreedom.org. With that, I'll hand it over to the Center's Director of Infrastructure Security and a U.S. Marine veteran, Tommy Wall. Adam, thank you. And I, and I really appreciate our guests being on, uh, both of which are, are veterans. I think I speak for all three of us when I say that, um, that really nothing that we ever did in uniform or might ever do in uniform uh, is just as important as the work being done uh, by those who keep the lights on in this country. Our, our very survival depends uh, on that electricity. And so just as we begin this discussion, uh, I want to thank those uh, out there who are working towards that end uh, to, to keep the, the electricity flowing and to protect that most critical infrastructure. Uh, in, in terms of introductions, I'd like to start really with Ambassador Hank Cooper. Uh, sir, you worked uh, obviously in uniform in the U.S. Air Force uh, as a veteran, but, but you also served at the highest levels of government uh, as President Reagan's chief negotiator with the Soviet Union on arms control, uh, which we ought to, we, we really need to thank you for, for that service. Um, as President Bush's director of the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, you are a renowned expert on some of the most profound national security topics uh, of the last half century. And I just, I noticed that more and more of your time and energy lately has been directed towards the grid, the electric grid. And I would just ask if you would take a moment uh, to share your thoughts uh, with the rest of the audience on, on the importance of that infrastructure. Well, thank you, Tommy. Uh, let me um, say how this happened. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, I was a junior officer in the Air Force and then later senior civilian at the Air Force Weapons Laboratory studying nuclear weapons effects, roughly the same time period in which we discovered electromagnetic pulse and the vulnerability of all our strategic systems. And it became a very highly classified subject. And, um, and, and so we worked the problem hard. We did what we could to protect our most important military systems, our strategic systems, our ICBMs, submarine launch ballistic missiles, bombers, all the command and control to communicate with them. And, uh, and that's all we did. We did nothing to protect the critical civil infrastructure, uh, except maybe unless you want to count the president's aircraft and so on to make sure he could control uh, the forces. And uh, frankly, there was a young lieutenant at the weapons lab at the same time by the name of Bill Graham, who later became the chairman of the EMP commission when they were chartered to bring this highly secret material out into the open. And that was in the 90s, I guess, the late 90s, early 2000 time period. And, and uh, he did that. And I thought everything was shaping up. And a few years later, I discovered that nobody was paying attention to it. They reinstated the uh, commission a couple of times. And that's when I got really concerned about the issue because I realized it was serious. When I was director of the SDI program, for example, I persuaded Dick Cheney, Secretary Cheney, to carve a half a billion dollars out of my five-year budget and send it to the Defense Nuclear Agency to do independent work and assessment of the missile defense programs that we were producing because it's a very complicated subject matter that we're dealing with, details matter, and, and it's not a matter of trusting the uh, professionals that work for me as much as the errors that might be made. And maintenance is really an important issue, and I wanted independent eyes looking at it. So I long believed EMP was a critically important subject. And when Bill was chairing that commission, I thought it was going to shape up. 
And frankly, uh, the bureaucracy seems to have done everything they could to block the product of that, uh, that important work, uh, which should be leading the nation's effort. And uh, so that's why I'm engaged today to try to try to join Bill again in the fight. Uh, and uh, we're making some progress and in other cases, not so much. Yeah, I look forward to, uh, I definitely look forward to talking about those areas where both progress is made and then the obstacles that we have to overcome. Uh, let me introduce for a moment uh, our other guest, uh, Command Sergeant Major Michael Maybe, retired from the U.S. Army. Michael, you uh, are no uh, stranger to disaster, having survived combat deployments overseas, uh, you, you know, in the World Trade Center uh, during the, the attacks on 9-11, on uh, survived the, the Great Northeast Blackout of 2003, uh, and recently relocated to Texas just in time for the most recent disaster to strike there. Uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about your observations of uh, of just what happens when the lights go out, because because it happened to you. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. And yeah, I would definitely advise everybody listening: don't buy the house next to mine, because it seems that disasters do follow me around. Um, but uh, you know, in this most recent disaster, and we'll talk about it a little more later. You know, we we have, uh, as we know today, at least 57 deaths, and we may not ever know for sure how many people died as a result of the grid collapse in Texas, and hundreds of billions of dollars in economic damage overall. And again, uh, you know, these numbers are going to flesh out over the coming months. But the human dimension. Uh, of this avoidable tragedy uh, was horrific. We had people dying of carbon monoxide poisoning trying to keep their families warm. We had people, uh, uh, you know, dying of exposure in Texas, you know, dying of hypothermia, uh, you know, people whose medical equipment failed because of the collapse of the electric grid and the collapse of the other critical infrastructures. Um, you know, one thing that as somebody who's kind of been looking at this problem for a long time, um, we were a little more prepared in my family than a lot of people were in Texas. And the interesting thing was uh, what we had going for us was solar panels on our roof, a wind turbine in our yard, and a wood stove in the living room. And, and that enabled my family to survive Unfortunately, many in Texas were not as, uh, you know, prepared or, you know, didn't have the resources to be able to survive it. And um, ultimately uh, that, uh, you know, there's lots of blame going around, but ultimately we failed uh, to protect the Texas grid from something that has happened several times in the past. You know, this uh, uh, 2021 outage was not an isolated event. You know, it, it's happened before, and unless we do something about it, it will happen again. Yeah, and Mike, if, if anybody knows uh, about the record of the government's knowledge and the industry's knowledge of the vulnerabilities of the grid, it's you. I mean, for those uh, in the audience that are not aware, Mike maintains what I think is probably the most comprehensive database on grid security in the world. I, I, in the past, had printed a copy of just the titles of all the studies, the testimony, the hearings, just the links that Mike has provided in that database, over 100 pages long, thousands, right? And so this is something that we've known about for a long time, right, Mike? I mean, this is, this is not yes. new. No, it is not new. We've known for decades. And uh, what I have here is a GAO report, if you can see the date on that. It's from 1981. The title of this report is Federal Electric Electrical Emergency Preparedness is Inadequate. That is four decades ago. Uh, the federal government was already talking about the um, inadequacy of our preparations um, and uh, the protections of the electric grid. And since right. then, study after study about how inadequately pr we're protected from weather, physical attack, cyber attack, EMP, a geomagnetic disturbance, all these other threats, and yet very, very little has been done, as Ambassador Cooper alluded to earlier. Yeah, and this is uh, this is something that's just it's inexcusable. You you said it's preventable, right? Texas is the the ninth largest economy in the world. The amount of energy that Texas produces in a single year could power all of the homes in the United States for four and a half years. And so you saw a lot of criticism. You mentioned the finger pointing back and forth. 
you know, I think Tucker Carlson ha- kind of made a good point when he said, you know, um, this is like starving to death in a grocery store, right? Now, Tucker was was really coming across against green energy on this. Mike, you just said you survived the, the, the power outage because you had green energy uh, at, at the localized level. There is something to this, though, when it comes to the U.S. federal government and state government and the utility industry's prioritizations. And they have been prioritizing renewables in many cases above resilience. And so I think that's the argument that was being made, but it's important for all of us to know that at least in this case, in the Texas blackout, every form of generation failed. We had coal, nuclear, natural gas, solar and wind all went down because of a lack of focus on resilience. And so Ambassador Cooper, that's what I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on that, kind of your observations when it comes to the priorities of the federal government, uh, of state governments and administrators in, in all the things that we need to worry about um, between the, the environment to our national security as it pertains to our most critical infrastructure, where do you see the priorities and where should they be? Well, let me, let me uh, preface what I'm going to say with uh, something I neglected to say at the outset, and that is our adversaries all recognize this problem. And every one of them, Russia, China, uh, North Korea, and Iran, include in their military doctrine attacking our electric power grid as a, as a major component of the cyber threat. Uh, and the Washington scene does not include it under cyber. We are spending a lot of money and effort there now in a disaggregated way to address uh, the cyber threat but they're very lax in dealing with the EMP uh, problem. I believe that uh, the Washington uh, establishment's dysfunctionality is sort of illustrated by the fact that Bill Graham had to, who chaired the EMP commission, as I told you, and is one of the national experts on this subject dating from the 1960s when we first discovered its problem, had to spend his own money to put the reports of that commission on the web because the federal government did not think it worth providing to the American people. So the federal government is failing at every level, including informing the people of the nature of the problem. Uh, The regulatory world is a disaggregated, um, dysfunctional activity. And and the one that uh, the federal Electrical Reliability Corporation has no responsibility, in fact, for the distribution grid, which makes up 90% of the overall nation's grid. And so we have a disaggregated bureaucracy, no one in charge. Uh, DOD once had the expertise, but all the young fellows, you know, they've gone. Where have all the flowers gone, you know, to go back to the 60s, Mary? <laughs> Right. Um, the song and so on. And uh, so the Department of Energy laboratories are trying to reinvent the wheel rather than taking what the DO, what the EMP commission has put together years ago over the last 20 years as what the problems are and what we should be doing. So I believe that the only way out of this mess is to go to the local level and begin working up. If we get expertise at the local level to A, understand that they have a a serious threat on their hands. And I have a friend who likes to say it's the third most important factor, you know, after air and water. But frankly, you don't get water if you don't have electricity. So right. it's really the second most important factor for life anymore right. in the United States of America. That isn't true all over the world. It is for us, though. So, I mean, you've got to get the people to understand it. Once the people understand it, I think maybe they w- will take the lead and uh, getting their leadership on board to address the problem. And moreover, uh, the, the, the will and the um, expertise is to work this problem from the bottom up. Well, I definitely want to get into a, a detailed discussion of how we do that from the bottom up. I think it, it's important for us as part of this education to allow people to understand a little bit about what you touched on. You touched on kind of the regulatory environment. You know, and, and the fact that you, know, you have three different parts of the grid. You have generation, you have transmission and distribution. Generators obviously make electricity. Transmission, which is the bulk power grid, you said it's only 10% of the grid, but it's a really important 10% that transmits it over long distances. And then distribution, distribution is 90% of the grid that, that gets it to people's homes or businesses. 
And so the federal government oversees that transmission part of the grid, the bulk power system. It is vitally important to the country. And Mike, you're I think you're probably one of the, the, the nation's foremost experts on kind of taking a uh, an outside look at that regulatory environment. You and, and Tom Popic, one of our other coalition members, tell us a little bit about how those um, how those reliability standards are created um, and, sure. and how the federal government oversees that. And then we can go into a discussion of like, what did that mean for the Texas blackout? Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And uh, Ambassador Cooper, you know, hit on this, the regulatory system of the electric grid of all three components, generation, transmission, and distribution um, is decentralized. I would actually best, I think it's best described for those of you old enough to remember the old Rube Goldberg cartoons. That is what the regulatory system of the electric grid looks like today. There are over 60 different regulators of different pieces of it when you count in the public utility commissions, the nonprofit organizations, and then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the uh, federal government. None of these pieces talk to each other about security on any meaningful basis, and there is no uh, you know, one entity or one person um, in charge of security of the electric grid. It's just completely decentralized. And as we've seen evidence of, uh, does not work. I'll give you one example of how this regulatory system is really inadequate. And that's the Great Northeast Blackout of 2003. Uh, the simplified version is a tree branch in Ohio contacted some transmission lines. And then as a result of the um, human error, computer error, machine error, there was a cascading outage where 55 million people lost their power, 10 million in Canada, 45 million in the United States, literally caused by a tree branch in Ohio. So there were congressional hearings and investigations and everybody was all up in arms about it. And in the end, it was decided that we needed to have a tree trimming standard uh, for the electric grid to prevent something like this from happening in the future. It took almost a decade, almost a decade to get a tree trimming standard in place. And one could argue when you look at what happened with the California wildfires, particularly the uh, the campfire where 86 people died as a result of a uh, failure of the tree trimming standard, that that uh, standard was inadequate. Um, and then we fast forward to um, what happened in Texas. So we knew this cold weather was coming. And this has happened before. In 1989, we had a blackout caused by a cold snap. In 2011, we had a blackout caused by a cold snap in Texas. And then 2021, we see this weather coming, and then the electric grid in Texas just collapsed when the cold weather arrived, as Tommy described, due to failure of every you know energy type that, that we had in the portfolio here in Texas. So Um, There are supposed to be mandatory reliability standards for for part of the electric grid, and they clearly they failed in Texas. You know, the the standards either were not adequate or were not enforced. Uh, So we'll probably talk more later about that. But I filed a complaint with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that in Texas, those standards either were inadequate or were not enforced. Right. Well, and that's what I want to get that because we 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 want to take this discussion from not just Texas, but this applies to the whole country. Absolutely. Right? So the same the same reliability standards that were established for the the grid that were not sufficient in Texas are the same standards across the board for the rest of the country. So I think it's important for our, for our viewers and listeners to understand uh, this can affect all of us, right? And so you know, Mike, uh, uh, good on you for having filed a complaint with the federal regular regulator for that, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We actually have an opportunity. We'll talk about that towards the end, but we have an opportunity where all of us can actually get involved uh, in that fight to propose that FERC create, uh, or I should say that the industry create and FERC approve a tougher and better enforced reliability standard to prevent blackouts like this. Now, I know, Ambassador Cooper, uh, your level of frustration with that process, right? Mike just described it, nine and a half years to take a, a vegetation management standard into creation. I, we understand that you have been in this fight the longest. And so uh, I recall your testimony before the Senate uh, Energy Natural Resources Committee four years ago about uh, about the, the just the bureaucracy in Washington and how slow it moves 
Uh, tell us, you know, what that has inspired you to do and what you share with the Senate back then and, and how you've progressed uh, till now uh, with this pilot project that you're, that you're doing in, in Lake Wiley. Sure. Um, as you said, uh, I, I became frustrated about five years ago, well, about six years ago now. And um, so I went to the head of the electrical engineering department at my university at Clemson, Clemson University was a college when I finished there. But uh, in any case, I asked for some of their graduates out of the double E department in Duke Energy, which is one of the nation's largest companies. And I um, and they did make the introductions and I got involved with them and they decided to cooperate in trying to figure out how to address this problem from the bottom up. And we decided, uh, if you know about South Carolina, uh, Rock Hill is the fourth largest city in South Carolina. It's a suburb of Charlotte, which is home of Duke Energy. And it had, Duke operates three power plants on the lake, Lake Wiley on the Catawba River that runs between North and South Carolina. Two of them are in York County, South Carolina, where a lot of folks who work at Duke Energy and including one of their important vice presidents. Anyway, they got on board, we're supportive. We got all the folk who were in positions of authority in uh, York County on board. Uh, the sheriff in particular, who's elected to protect the people was key. Uh, a, a physician, a retired, retired physician who understood what we were talking about his technical training and so on and became excited about trying to deal with this issue. You know, it turns out knows just everybody who matters. In, inside of Rock Hill in York County. And the distribution grid um, for York County is run by two, uh, one's a co-op and the other's a municipal uh, company. And that presides the electricity for over 90% of the people in York County. So we decided we would try to figure out what it takes, first of all, to understand uh, what the problems were uh, vulnerabilities were in their grid, their distribution grid, and then secondly, what it would cost to repair it. And I'll save talking about that until later. But that's how we got started. And uh, the folks in the Energy Committee heard about this. And Senator Murkowski uh, had a hearing. Uh, Newt Gingrich co-testified with me, and he elaborated on the threat and what a problem it was and so on. And I introduced the uh, the Lake Wiley project, at least, is my my rationale of what we should be doing overall. We were midstream then. We completed that over two years ago now, and uh, we've been sitting waiting on help from Washington uh, to execute what we the lessons learned. If we learn those lessons there, and we're prepared to take it elsewhere inside of the state of South Carolina, because the the adjutant general of the state is on board, the national guard's on board. Uh, as well as the representatives of most of the places we'd like to go. But we we are waiting on Washington. Here we right. are one more right. time. Well, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it may, and I want to get into the cost uh, momentarily, but I want to I think for just a minute about what are, what are the costs of inaction? What are the costs of, of not uh, providing this resilience to the, to the infrastructure? Mike, you've, you've done research. On, on the cost of this last blackout versus uh, the ounce of prevention. Walk us through a little bit about uh, what you've learned in that research. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the first thing I, I always want to put before any monetary costs is the human costs. At least 57 people have died as a result of the collapse of the Texas grid. And to me, you know, that is the most, you know, the, the, the most egregious and unacceptable cost is that people died because the electricity that they need to survive was cut out because of a preventable, um, a pre you know, preventable weather system that came through. And if we're that unprepared for weather, um, then, you know, how prepared are we for a cyber attack? How prepared are we for a coordinated physical attack? Or how prepared are we for, um, you know, an EMP or GMD event? So the, the human cost, you know, in my mind comes first. But now let's talk about the economic costs. So in one recent study by the Perryman Group, uh, right now the costs of the uh, 
winter storm in Texas are going to come somewhere between 195 billion with a B up to about 295 billion with a B. That you know is the economic cost um, of losing our power grid for just a you know a few days in the case of the Texas blackout. Now just just imagine the costs of a cyber attack or an EMP attack or a coordinated physical attack where the grid goes down for a longer period. It's, it's astronomical. Um, the Foundation for Resilient Societies, which is one of the primary nonprofit groups in this fight for grid resilience, uh, has looked at um, the cost you know, based on mitigation versus the cost of the disaster. And, and what they found, not surprisingly, is that for um, you know, uh, about a 14 billion cost spread out over uh, 10 years, we could have avoided the cost of the disaster itself. So in essence, you know, an ounce of prevention is most certainly worth a pound of disaster. And because we failed to do that, uh, you know, the costs to the, uh, you know, Texas economy are going to be in the hundreds of billions, uh, and not to mention the cost of the lives. And, and, it, and it goes so far beyond Texas, right? This yeah. past week, Honda and Toyota had to shut down domestic manufacturing of automobiles because of a plastics, a global plastic shortage, because those plants in Texas had to be shut down and, and the amount of time that it takes to get them back up uh, after a blackout. So we're talking about costs that span well beyond uh, just the uh, the Texas grid. Uh, and this, so this, is, this makes it relevant for everyone. Now, it, I, I have heard people, you know, mention that it's just it's kind of unthinkable when you when you talk about the cost of a protracted grid outage because of something like an electromagnetic pulse. Ambassador Cooper, you mentioned the EMP commission and the EMP commission studies, you know, their estimate for what we would lose in one year was 90 percent of our population. Uh, and that's just by virtue of you know, how many people lived in North America or in the United States prior to electricity, about 30 million. Um, if we didn't have electricity, then we would probably lose all but about 30 million. Personally, I think it could be much worse than that. It's almost unthinkable. And so what, what is so inspiring right now, I think, is that it, it, it's actually affordable in order to protect the grid. I'd like you to, if you could, Ambassador, um, talk to us about the study that, that you all have conducted uh, in, in Lake Wally and, and some of the experts involved and kind of some of the numbers that you've come up with in terms of costs. Okay. Again, I want to say this is for the distribution grid. It's important because it's 90% of the overall grid in the nation. And, and it's where all of the citizens in York County got their electricity. You know, that serves the hospital, it serves the homes, it serves the, the uh, industry, uh, it serves the businesses, you know, whatever. So it's really key to the local folk. And that's the bottom line of that. You got to get the electricity to it. And that's the, the bulk power problem. And Duke Energy has that problem. And there are lots of, lots of issues to be dealt with. And before I forget it, I want to mention Duke Energy gave almost two years, over two years ago, I think now, a large transformer uh, for testing. And we've never tested one against EMP at the Savannah River National Laboratory. And it was moved to the North Charleston in South Carolina two years ago, and it's been sitting idle there for less than a million dollars to ship it up the river and set it up for testing at the Savannah River National Labs. It's too big to move across the highways and whatever. I mean, if you've ever looked at one of these humongous transformers, you know what I mean. But that again illustrates the lethargy in Washington. The cost that we went through, I got George Baker, Dr. George Baker, who is uh, retired now from three different jobs, at least, I guess. Um, he, he was in charge of the DODs, the Department of Defense's uh, research, development, assessment activities of electromagnetic pulse matters uh, for, for all of our strategic forces and so on, including uh, keeping up with things after they were protected. So he's well aware of what the issues are. And I persuaded him pro bono. I mean, nobody, I think the uh, Foundation for Resilient Societies actually paid his uh, salary, not his salary, but his, his transportation costs to come down and do an assessment 
and then go through and work with, I forget now who it was, someone else, and estimating what it would cost to protect the grid. Uh, everybody in York County was supportive. The director of emergency management, the head of the hospital, the uh, mayor of, uh, of, um, of uh, Rock Hill and his, uh, his overall manager for all these matters, the water works and so on. And he assessed all of that activity. Bottom line was that it would cost less than $100, actually much less than $100 uh, per citizen in York County to provide protection to assure the major components of that grid, the water works, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the communications, the, uh, the civil support and so on that you require to recover in, in the case of a major disaster. And, uh, and to continue to operate. Now that's trivial, I don't know about you, but anymore when I take my wife out for dinner, I spend $100 if it's right. a nice restaurant uh, or more. So I mean, it's ridiculous to argue that costs stand in our way. And uh, it's just nonsense, it's just nonsense. If I take that estimate and uh, bankroll it up from what you said earlier about the population of the country, you're talking about something in excess of $30 billion, if that estimate is good. I'd like to have the funds to validate it by actually hardening that section so that we have hard data and know right. what it would take to protect it, and also to um, work an alliance by way of the National Guard, which has a nationwide responsibility to all of our governors and the local people to activities in Texas, which is another place where they're working problem from bottom right. up, as you know, San Antonio, Texas. And the National Guard is key involvement there. We have an organization in South Carolina, which is a direct report through the National Guard to First Air Force at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida and Army North, which is at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. And also he's a direct report to NORTHCOM, which has the nation's ability to do this. So we have the network of taking the lessons learned and spreading it throughout the country if only we could get Washington to support this. I mean, right. our adjutant general's on board. I can't imagine any adjutant general that would fight trying to do this, and I know personally that a, num a number would support it. So when you ask, what have we done? That's what we've done, and we've been sitting on our hands now for two years waiting on Washington's help. Well, I appreciate you mentioning the San Antonio project too, Ambassador, because I, I recall the stories I heard of how that started. Uh, you know, when we when we think about again EMP, right? Um, there was a the, the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force EDTF that was uh, uh, the brainchild of Lieutenant General Stephen Quast. They had a series of summits, and I remember hearing about at the very beginning when he when he challenged the participants to figure out, you know, how do we contend with this threat of EMP? Um, one of the participants kind of said, well, do you expect us to boil the ocean? Right? I mean, that was the level of stress and, and sort of weight on their shoulders. Um, but after a couple of summits and a few years of working, what ended up coming out of that EDTF was this pilot project. And, and it, for me, it, it kind of goes back to if someone would have went to, to, uh, to a to well, not all scientists, but most in the 1930s and said, hey, we expect you to split an atom, right? They, they, do you expect me to boil the ocean? Albert Einstein had an idea, and the United States had a Manhattan Project who sought just one goal, a bomb. Two different bombs of two different designs that both worked and ended World War II. So what you just shared with us is inspiring because it's similar. We need a Manhattan Project for this, to address the vulnerabilities of our grid to all hazards, but you protect against EMP, you can protect against many of the lesser threats. And so to know that we have a pilot project in San Antonio, a pilot project in Lake Wiley that both have maybe two different designs but could potentially work is inspiring. What I want to talk about for a moment before we get into the Q&A, because we want to give some time for our, for our audience to ask questions, I want to talk about what are the obstacles? What are the obstacles going to be or what have they traditionally been to us taking these pilot projects, for example, or any of the other top-down or bottom-up approaches to securing our, our nation's most critical infrastructure. Mike, I, I want to start with you. Sure. Um, so, you know, there has been, and, you know, a lot of people listening might be, you know, wondering, well, you know, 
you know, why doesn't Congress do something or, you know, why, you know, don't we enact a law to protect the grid? Well, that has been attempted on numerous occasions. Uh, there is a whole string of dead grid security bills that never made it through Congress. And in my research, what I believe is one of the biggest obstacles to grid security is the electric utility industry itself, and specifically their very, very powerful lobby. So in the last decade, the electric utility industry lobby has spent $1.2 billion, billion with a B, lobbying the federal government alone. This is not even to count what they're spending at the state level with public utility commissions. So they've spent 1.2 billion lobbying and largely when a grid security bill comes up that you know we thought might actually have an impact, the electric utility industry lobby lobbies against it. Oh, it's not necessary, you, you know, we've got it, we're gonna handle it. And um, in addition to the lobbying money, they've spent, um, in the last decade, $150 million in political contributions, mainly to the uh, members of key committees in the House of Representatives and the Senate that are in charge of grid security issues. So one of the biggest obstacles that I've seen is the amount of money flowing into the bureaucracy uh, resisting uh, efforts to try to protect the grid. Right, and where do they get that money from, Mike? Oh, yeah, well, there's the true irony. That comes from our electric bill. So my friends, if you pay an electric bill, you are paying the grid, the uh, uh, electric utility industry to lobby against grid security. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is pretty ironic. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I want to talk a little bit about what we can do, though, about it. And uh, Ambassador Cooper, uh, if you would, just um, if, if what challenges uh, do you see that we're going to need to overcome um, when it comes to this this challenge of security one, grid. One thing I just wanted to say is that I mentioned transformers earlier, and we haven't mentioned it yet, but we should recognize the fact that we're buying a lot of transformers uh, from China. We think there are, what, 300 of them in our grid, these big transformers, and the very large one, maybe it's 200 instead of 300. And I said earlier, we've never tested them against EMP, uh, now, at least, I think people are aware of the cyber threat, which is uh, more of uh, directly, uh, uh, I think most people understand what the cyber threat is. What they don't appreciate is that EMP is like a major cyber threat because you cover the whole country with a pulse that could cause this kind of damage. But here it is, we, we now have in our grid transformers we bought from China, I guess to save money because once upon a time we built them here, we don't, but we don't build them in this country anymore. And if anything goes down and we lose one, it takes a considerable amount of time to replace it. So if I had to point at one, one item that we could use some help is, is early is getting on top of the transformer issue. And uh, again, the bureaucracy seems to be sitting on its hand, both on general uh, issues that have to do with the cyber threat, but most particularly with respect to the CMP problem. So I would I would just point to that as a key problem that that folks need to address, and um, I forget what you really asked me to talk about, Tommy. No, it, it was it was obstacles and challenges, and so you know you've already described that we have a challenge when it comes to transformers, folks. That's the backbone of our grid. The grid does not operate without the transformers, at least the grid we have now, right? As Ambassador Cooper said, they are nearly irreplaceable. Mike, you've done a ton of research on this and I, you identified the number of Chinese transformers. We know that at least two of those Chinese manufactured transformers have had hardware backdoors installed on them. This is such a serious problem that the federal government last August seized one at the port of Houston, transported under federal escort to Sandia National Laboratories to have it uh, taken apart and observed. So Ambassador, you're absolutely right about that issue. Here's some good news. Right now, so we, we started with Texas and we talked about how this applies to the whole nation. Right now in Texas, there's legislation that's been sponsored by Senator Bob Hall and his colleagues on the House side that will address a lot of the issues we've talked about. Ambassador Cooper just mentioned the, the, the transformers are something as part of a supply chain vulnerability. At the federal level, the supply chain uh, executive order that President Trump signed last May was suspended by the Biden administration. We petitioned 
the Biden administration, Secretary Granholm, urging her to make sure that it wasn't just reinstated, but that it was better enforced. And, and maybe we'll get into the response that we got. Um, but what I want to do is just I want to to let the audience know that there are a few ways that we can get involved. Uh, what we'll do is we'll save a few minutes towards the end for us to discuss the ways that we can get involved uh, in this process, because I think we, we can make a difference. Uh, at the moment, what I want to do is just, just open it up for questions from the audience. That way, when we get to the point where we talk about what you can do, uh, it's in consideration with the types of questions that are on your minds right now. So Adam Savitt, if you would um, do us a favor, go through the types of questions that you received over the past 40 minutes. Uh, we'll take a little bit of time to answer those. Certainly. Well, first of all, do you think the Biden administration is taking the grid security seriously? So, um, um, would me, you like to ask my guess? Yeah. Um, so, and, and I'll, uh, and, and, you know, you'll probably get different answers from different people, but, um, what I would say to that in general is that we've got four decades of failure of both red and blue administrations. So this isn't a red problem or a blue problem. In terms of whether the Biden administration in particular is taking this seriously, uh, that is yet to be seen. Secretary Granholm did in her confirmation hearing say that uh, the security of the electric grid was critical. I, for one, intend to hold her to that and hold her accountable for those words she said. And if you know the Department of Energy comes through and surprises us all, then then great. And if not, you know I I think that uh, our government needs to be held accountable for protecting the people. And it has failed over decades, uh, both red and blue administrations. I would tell you this. Yeah, um, I would just second what you said. And uh, Nick, Tommy, you ought to say what you got in your response to your letter to the Department of Energy about this suspended bill uh, and, it, and the fact that it was for cyber only. I mean, again, <laughs> I'm hung up on that issue. So I think that the Biden administration is dead serious about electrification. OK, um, we look at who they appointed for Department of Transportation. Department of Energy. These are people who, um, you know, have, have a kind of a track record of promoting electrification, electrification of vehicles, for example, and the transportation sector is supposed to be good for the environment, right? One of the things we have to understand, though, is it requires battery storage, which right now, China has just about the, the, the world's uh, most control on all the components that we would need for that. Now, Ambassador Cooper, what you just mentioned about the response we got from the Department of Energy, we sent a letter to Secretary Granholm urging that this su supply chain executive order would be reinstated, okay, that it would be strengthened, it, it would be enforced, that they would take part of it and test the transformer that Ambassador Cooper, you know, discussed. I received a response yesterday uh, from the Department of Energy from the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Office of Electricity. I'm just going to read two sentences that I highlighted. DOE is committed to ensuring industry expertise and experience are incorporated into any potential recommendations and DOE's collaboration on identifying and mitigating supply chain vulnerabilities continues. Industry expertise and experience. Exactly. So the federal government is planning on continuing to only talk to the electric power industry, the same industry that uses the millions of dollars to lobby against protecting the grid that Mike just talked about. It's the outside expertise that I think that the government needs to look to, right? The independent expertise. And at the moment, our Secure the Grid Coalition and the, and the nonprofits that are part of it uh, are, are a watchdog for that, an unfunded watchdog. Um, so I, I hope that helps a little bit in terms of where we think this is going. Uh, Adam, I, next question. Yeah, Ambassador. I have one thought. I mentioned earlier, that when I was running the SDI program, I sent a half a billion dollars to the Defense Nuclear Agency so they would be an ed independent red team. That should ring a bell for the veterans here. To look right. over the shoulder of my engineers to make sure that what we did actually uh, accomplished what our objectives were. That needs to be the case. And when they got rid, and this came at the instigation of folks in the Department of Energy and DOD at the time, uh, of the EMP commission, we no longer have a red team looking over the shoulder of what this process is. 
that's a big missing element. Agree. So, of course, uh, Texas is the only state with its own power grid. Uh, does the fact that it failed to join larger power grids perhaps uh, contribute to this outage? Uh, Tommy, I'd love to take that one. Right. Um, you were there. So, yeah, Texas does have its own uh, power grid, and um, it still is subject to all of the same threats as everything else. Um, the net, the security of the national power grid, other than Texas, is already a mess. Uh, we're not prepared for cyber. We're not prepared for uh, coordinated physical attacks. So um, the fact of Texas having its own separate grid, I don't think um, would have been impacted at all if Texas had fallen under, you know, the the federal regulation. I think the exact same thing would have happened. So I don't think there's any advantage to Texas, um, you know, joining the uh, federal grid, which is already not, you know, secure and um, has all of these same problems. Um, I think that ultimately Texas can be a role model for the rest of the country by, you know, having a more secure grid in Texas and showing the rest of the country how to do it, because for decades we failed as a nation to protect our electric grid. Thank you. Ambassador Cooper, I know you, you also feel strongly about what we keep hearing about this urge. Oh, Texas was on their own. That's why their grid failed. They should be connected to the east and west interconnection. They should be further regulated by the federal government. Um, your thoughts on that? I worry that's a siren call, you know, from if you if you remember from your college or high school or wherever you studied um, the Odyssey. But um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm with uh, Bob Hall, who was a young uh, junior officer in the 60s working these issues as well on our Minuteman system. And he has a legislation in Texas to form their own approach to dealing with this issue. And they really need to do it. I'm in favor of this bottom up approach. Let them be a model for how our state can take care of this. This is a lone star take that to the state. They have this attitude historically about managing things themselves. Let them do it. Give them the support they need to make it successful. I want to tie to it. That's what Absolutely. I want. And I want to use the National Guard to do it because the National Guard works for the governors of all of our states. And, and that's where we can work this problem across the nation, obviously. And the National Guard's. Uh, duties become almost impossible if we if we lose the grid. So I, I would hope that they'd be motivated to get involved. Adam, next question. We spend a lot of money on the DOD, especially our nuclear deterrent, but China and Russia would hack and knock out our grid before they launch kinetic weapons. Why can't we make the grid the number one defense issue and channel DOD funds there? That is a great question. Um, and and yeah, we, we actually have an executive order that actually came out during the Obama administration called PPD-21, which identifies the 16 critical infrastructures in the United States. And the granddaddy of all of them is the ener energy in infrastructure because of its enabling effects on all the other infrastructures. We can kind of see the impacts of that from this Texas blackout. When the Texas grid collapsed, we lost our transportation infrastructure. We lost our water infrastructure. Millions of people in Texas were under boil water orders. Uh, we lost our uh, food was not coming into the grocery stores. The grocery shelves were empty. So we can see the impacts on all of these critical infrastructures. So I totally agree uh, with that. Uh, uh, the person who asked that question, the security of the electric grid needs to be a high priority in the national defense of the United States. It is the a kill shot. It is the Achilles heel of the United States. Any adversary who can take out the electric grid, whether it's a cyber attack, a coordinated physical attack through whatever means, or whether it's mother nature taking it out through extreme weather or a solar flare, the United States grinds to a halt without the electric grid. Can I add a thought to that? Because I agree with you, Mike, and I'm old enough to remember when civil defense was part of the Department of Defense. And in the 1970s, it was moved to IRTA and then FEMA and all of that and adopted a whole bunch of other things other than civil defense, the protection of the American people. Uh, I think there ought to be consideration to revive it. 
that office or something akin to it, uh, because I don't believe that FEMA really is qualified or able these days to deal with this particular issue. And unfortunately, they don't have the bureaucratic or political um, uh, leverage to succeed in making the right things happen. They're within the Department of Homeland Security, which also has not been very effective in dealing with this issue as an overall thing. There are some good people there. I don't want to challenge uh, just everybody who works there, but the, but the results show uh, you know the failure. And um, we need a we need a hard look at how we're organized to deal with this issue. And and I I would just say you know yes you can take it out of the DoD budget. But we just threw $1.9 trillion at the wall, as far as I'm concerned, and there is no shortage of money. They are now arguing about infrastructure. They can put wherever they want that money. They can put it in the Department of Defense. They can put it somewhere else. But this issue should be front and center to be dealt with. Let me just add to that, Ambassador. Thank you for mentioning that. Adam, the, the, the question was about the military. Um, the military answers to civilian authorities. Civilian authorities is who we elect, right? And so what we've seen in the past is that the military leaders who tried to be aggressive with this, Lieutenant General Stephen Quas, is now Stephen Quas, civilian. His career didn't last long, okay? If you want real change, if you want the military, anybody, anybody in government to address this, it's going to have to come from the people that they answer to, which are the elected officials who are supposed to answer to us, right? And so in, in a moment, we're going to talk about a way that we can start to inspire some change there. Uh, but we, we, we're not going to be able to expect the military to do much unless it's coming from the elected officials. So uh, let's get a couple more questions if we could, and then we'll talk about the way forward. Was the Texas power outage largely the fault of Democrats who forced Texas to rely too much on wind turbines, or is Governor Abbott overplaying the role of green energy mandates? Let me take that one real quick, if y'all would. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of finger pointing back and forth on, on the Texas blackout, right? Uh, were there mandates for renewables? Yes. Was it just Democrat? No. OK, as Mike mentioned before, both sides of the political aisle ha have mandated renewables. OK, and, and I think it comes from a good place in, in their heart that generally speaking, renewables are, are clean, right? They, they, yeah, they come from Mother Nature. Um, but an over-reliance on renewables and disregarding resilience is what led to, to, to what we just saw in Texas, okay? It's a combination of things. And so that's what, what I, what I want to see is for the finger pointing to stop and for both sides to, to decide that resilience is just as important as environmental stewardship. Um, and because the reality is when the lights go out, it's an environmental catastrophe. And that's part of the thing that Senator Hall has described, Texas State Senator Hall has described in the preamble uh, to his legislation, which, uh, which we'll talk about in just a moment. I think uh, we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, and, and let me just, one more thing I do wanna mention, Governor Abbott can point all the fingers he wants, but he has been warned twice in 2015 in 2018 by the congressional delegation, our federally elected officials, that the grid is vulnerable, that Washington was moving too slow, and that Texas should take the initiative to secure the grid against all hazards. Two warnings prior to this Texas blackout. So um, our, our viewers should know that. Uh, we, we, I don't know that we'll get another chance. Go ahead with the last question. Here's an interesting challenge. Is there a path to tackle this problem that does not increase bureaucracy? That's a good question, right? Because um, it seems bureaucracy always grows. Uh, let me uh, let me ask, uh, Mike, I, I think you may have some thoughts on ways that the, uh, the industry could be um, prompted to do the right thing that wouldn't increase yeah. the size of bureaucracy. Yeah, no, and, and I, uh, I, I absolutely do. And, and the bottom line is this has been going on for years, mostly above our heads in the government and the industry. And as people who pay electric bills, as people whose power went out, as people whose families depend on this, we have to take action. We can't just sit by, watch it on the news and, and roll our eyes. We've got to take action. 
and there are presently some things that our you know uh, viewers out there can do and can encourage other people they know to do that will make a difference ultimately the government is accountable for us we elect these people and we send them to washington and if they don't do something to protect your family then they need to go we need to be heard in the ballot box next time around but meanwhile we've got to start making noise that the uh, protection of the electric grid is something that we want them to tackle. Yep. Ambassador Cooper, any thoughts on that? I'll share some at the end and then we'll we'll talk about our way forward. I, I just want to add the thought that as I have tried to emphasize and what we're doing down here and what I think the folks in San Antonio are doing, if you give the resources to the local people so that they learn about this problem and can engage in protecting themselves, that is the best solution. Unfortunately, Washington has a different approach to everything. They want to study it forever and then tell you what to do. And I think this problem is one where details matter. And the people who have to execute have to know what they're doing. And so it's ultimately important for the local people to understand that issue. You might as well start at that point and give them the resources. Washington, supposed, they swore they swore to uh, provide for the common defense. The way Washington can do that is to give the resources to the local people to get the job done. Agree. And I will say this to the, to the concept of a bureaucracy. There is one way where it would need to be the right people and a small, we don't even need to call it a bureaucracy, we call it a commission. The legislation in Texas authored by State Senator Bob Hall would create a grid security commission that would be populated by the right people and have outside expertise, the red team that Ambassador Cooper talked about, so that it could look at the Texas grid with an all hazards approach. If you look at that bill, the definition of all hazards is the most, most detailed I have ever seen. And to give folks some hope, right now, there's 31 senators in Texas. 22 of them have co-sponsored that bill. That's, that is a solid majority, that's gonna pass, right? And that's bipartisan. So that's one way we have going forward that, that you can support that. Got a couple minutes left. Let me, let me just talk about what people can do right now. We talked about the failures of the federal government. Part of the reason why those failures are taking place is because our elected officials and the people that are appointed uh, in these different bureaucracies of the federal government, they don't, really, they don't really hear from us enough. They hear plenty from the electric power industry as Mike shared with us, but they don't hear from us, right? And in the wake of this Texas blackout, this is an opportunity for us to have our voices heard. What we've done, our Secure the Grid Coalition, which as I mentioned before, this is the watchdog for this topic, for this industry, and for the government. What we have created uh, at our page, securethegrid.com, if you go to that page, there's a little tab that says Take Action. If you go there, what it will do is it will lead you to a number of steps that you can take to actually get involved. One of them is to reinforce something that Mike maybe started. That was a complaint to the federal regulators, FERC, that the, you know, the reliability standards that we just discussed, that they were insufficient and that they were insufficiently enforced. We have an opportunity there where you can have your voice heard in two ways. You can easily write to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to have them investigate those reliability standards, ask them to, to make sure that the standards address all the threats, just like Ambassador Cooper just mentioned, cyber EMP, supply chain vulnerabilities, and there's a second step, and it's an, it's an amazing uh, tool that we, we just, one of our uh, coalition members, David Tice, uh, created, and that is a link that will allow you, with a few clicks of your mouse, to send a letter to key officials in your state. Ambassador Cooper talked about the National Guard. It would hit them, public service commissioners, your state elected officials, and the U.S. elected officials, all based on your address. And so you go to securethegrid.com, and you can click on Take Action, and follow the steps there, you can actually make a difference. The deadline for those comments to FERC is April 5th. So we ask you not to waste any time with that. Adam, that concludes my comments. If you would like to uh, to close us out, we really appreciate everybody's time uh, being with us to, to help us figure out a way to secure our nation's most critical infrastructure. Thank you, Tommy. Our upcoming events, uh, remember these are all Wednesday at 1 p.m. Next week, March 31st, where is the Biden administration's Iran policy going? featuring David Wormser, Victoria Coates, and moderated by Center President Fred Flights. The next week, April 7th, the past, present, and future of terror finance investigation, 
featuring Raymond Orzel and the center's Kyle Scheidler. We enjoyed having you here today. Remember, the center's important work is only possible because of your generous support. If you do enjoy these weekly programs as much as I do, please visit our website at securefreedom.org. Click on the big red donate button in the upper right corner where you can make an instant contribution by credit card and get more info about other methods of giving. Thanks to our guests. We'll see you here next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Thanks very much.